Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast of the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Library and former dean in the School of Biblical and Theological Studies at Wheaton College. Our purpose in these podcasts is really pretty simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so that we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but also to live it. Joining me today is Dr. Paul Anderson, who's professor of Biblical and Quaker Studies at George Fox University, located in Newburgh, Oregon. He's, the, he's an expert, world-class expert on the fourth gospel known around the planet for his books and thoughts and insights into the gospel of John. Paul, welcome. Thanks for being with us. Hey, thank you, David. Great to be with you. You've got such a great voice. I mean, I'm, you know, it's, I've heard you before on, on tape and it sounds so great. So I'm going to try, it's so soothing. That's the problem. That's, that's, your voice is so soothing, but it's good to see. So how, how did you get started reading Greek? Tell me about that. Yeah. Well, I uh, majored in Christian ministries at, at Malone College, now Malone University, mm-hmm. and so I took Greek there. I worked with Bob Buswell, who was a great uh, Greek scholar. And by the way, one of the texts that we used was this book by Sake Kubo, a reader's Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. One of the great things that book does is to show you the frequency of words in a particular chapter or book, and likewise, the lack of frequency. As I remember, if you knew about 300 Greek words, then you could put that book aside and say, well, these are the books that, uh, these are the words, I mean, that occur frequently in Matthew yeah. or John or Acts or some other book like that. Yeah, and so it was a brilliant awesome. book. It was very helpful. Yeah. There's a lot of helps out there these days with computers and other kinds of things, but uh, Sake Kubo has a, is close to my heart. Now, one of the things you, you, you've done is you've written a book called The Riddles of the Fourth Gospel, published in 2011, as I recall. Uh-huh. It's been, been around a little while. But I want to I want to look at, in particular, the prologue and get your sort of comments and thoughts, uh-huh. big picture, because a part of the, the task of exegesis is not only to read a particular few verses, but to see those verses within the larger element of the narrative of the book, let's say. Uh-huh. But as we read the Christ hymn, what are, we, what, what are the clues that you see there regarding uh, how the book was put together and uh, any kind of implicit audience? Yeah, uh, thanks so much, David. Obviously, the Christ hymn in John 1 makes a beautiful introduction. It's highly theological. It even draws in you know, pre-existent theology. It, it sets the stage for the entire gospel. But because it is theological, sometimes scholars have said, oh, therefore, John is not historical. And yet, Mm. the Christ hymn has some vocabulary that doesn't occur elsewhere in the gospel, at least not with great frequency. Some vocabulary is more similar uh, to the vocabulary of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Mm. And so I think it's wrong to see the prologue as the first stroke of the quill. John is writing theology, not history. And some of the work that I've done with the John Jesus and History Project, we're asking, how is John also historical? Should John be excluded from historical Jesus studies? So I'm also arguing for a fourth quest for Jesus, my next book, <laughs> by the way, um, which would include the Gospel of John as historical witness, not just Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mm. Now, now here, here, here are some of the themes, though, that suggest to me that if you look at the Christ hymn, it's very similar to 1 John 1, 1 to 3. So in 1 John 1, 1 to 3, you have the word of life we've heard from the beginning. We have seen and heard those kinds of themes. Um, and so if those three verses came from hearing the evangelist tell the stories of Jesus, oh, well, maybe that's how the prologue began. It gets yeah, you yeah. as a final introduction, drawing people into an experiential confession but it wasn't the first stroke of the quill. And so maybe the first edition of John was more like Mark, and therefore maybe uh, beginning with John the Baptist, uh, verses 6 through 8 and 15, 
and then going on to 19, et cetera. So, oh yeah. And so therefore an augmentation of Mark, but that's, the, but that's later on as part of a, a, a composition theory. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, so that's words as logos. Uh, it doesn't occur elsewhere in John as the preexistent word. It's more the word of Jesus. Uh, it does occur that the word of God uh, happens also in first John. Uh, how about monogenes, uh, only begotten one? Yes. Uh, that yeah, also right. occurs uh, in in first John 2, 14. And so you have that kind of theme that, that happens there. Sorry, that, that's logos that happens in 2, 14. Uh, right, right. But you do have uh, then first John 4, 9. Uh, you have uh, the only begotten son that is from the father father uh, how about mm-hmm. play roma uh you have that mentioned in in second john uh one eight uh speaking of fullness uh mm-hmm. how about mm-hmm. starts uh you have that in in john six yeah flesh you know flesh. eating the flesh my flesh and drink my blood right uh, right and so there you have in john six which i think also might be a later addition or part of you know so maybe uh, it, it's added to harmonize john with matthew mark and luke mm. then his testimony is true that coincides with the the reference to the eyewitness he saw these things his testimony mm-hmm. is true john nine uh, 34 and 35. So if you look at third John, our testimony is true. Uh, that might mm-hmm. suggest that if there are two Johns uh, buried at Ephesus, according to Papias, one is right. John the Apostle, one is John the Elder, maybe uh, John the Elder, after writing the epistles, finalizes the gospel and sends it off. Uh, in John 21, Jesus never said he wouldn't die. Peter got it wrong from day one in Mark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. said, Peter, what is the youth? He lives till I come again. And so, and so perhaps after the death of the beloved disciple, then the, then John, the, the elder then sends it off. His testimony is true as the witness of the beloved disciple. And then the later material. So the later material includes the plur- prologue chapter 21, uh, chapters 15 to 17. So let us depart. End of 14 goes into 18 one to begin with adding John 6 as a way of harmonizing John with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, then Mm -hmm. um, just by looking at the distinctive Greek, we have an affirmation of kind of an overall theory of John's composition. Now, when you say John, do you mean as well 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? Yeah, yeah. And so if you have all of that, so it's not just the Gospel of John, the 4th Gospel, but also 1, 2, and 3 John. Yeah, uh, so those are written by John the Elder. At least he called himself the Elder at the beginning of 2nd John and 3rd John. And, mm-hmm. and, and therefore, if we have, we have two leaders in John's church, John the Apostle and John the Elder, then, yeah, after the death of the beloved disciple, John the Elder circulates the gospel around 100 AD. That coheres with Eusebius' testimony around the age of Trajan. Now, so how, how common is the name John? I mean, because we have to talk about John the Apostle, oh, John love, the Elder. How love, common is it? Uh, and that may be why it's not included as the author. How common is the name Mary? Notice that the, mm. the mother of Jesus is not named why you got Mary Magdalene, you've got Mary yeah. Clopas, uh, you've got Mary and Martha. So maybe the anonymity of the mother of Jesus, because we know her, we respect her, and there are a bunch of Marys out there. So if you ask, why is John not named, or why is a blood disciple not named? Well, those of Zebedee are named in chapter 21, verse 2, but you also have then, we know him, we respect him, and there's a bunch of Johns out there, John the Baptist, uh, Peter, son of John, <laughs> uh, John the right. Elder, and so, yeah, and so exactly. why mention exactly. John when we all know it's the beloved disciple anyway? Now, I, right. I've, I've just got a per, an overlooked first century clue to John's authorship. Would you like to hear? All right. Yeah, I would love to hear about that. Yeah, so real scholars that. know, they know that <laughs> there's no way John could be written by an eyewitness because it's theological and it's different. Now, yeah. all historians know that there's only one historical report. Nobody has a second historical witness ever. Of course, that's true. Totally <laughs> um, but when, exactly. okay, so as I was doing my PhD at Glasgow, University of Glasgow, I just, I'm just looking everything up. Uh, looking up Peter, looking up John, looking up Mary, looking up everything in the Greek. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, I found a statement in Acts 4, 19 and 20, where mm-hmm. Peter and John are quoted. And I looked through 20 commentaries on Acts, and nobody had noticed this. The first statement is Petrine. 
Peter says also in Acts 5.29 and 11.17, we must obey God rather than man. So that presents Peter as making a Petrine cliche. Mm -hmm. But if it's a composite statement, like Sean Adams is talking about, who is at Glasgow now, he wasn't there when I was there. But the next statement is totally Johannine. We cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. And what we have seen and heard, first person, plural, Oh, wow. There's Sounds only just one like time yeah. that in all of Luke Acts, Luke holds those together. And that's this passage. And the closest parallel is 1 John 1, 3. What we have seen and heard from the beginning, we proclaim you the word of life. So that's a full century before Irenaeus. It approximates the fact that John the Apostle, not John the Elder, is presented as speaking a Johannine cliche. And that's a Greek fact. Wow. Interesting. It's not my fault. I only read it. <laughs> Paul, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. Thanks again to Silvio Vasquez, Rebecca Larson, and Krista Sanchez for helping us edit and produce the podcast. Thanks to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, theology, any of this stuff, boy, the best place to do that is Wheaton College. They have a wonderful program, whether you're looking for graduate or undergraduate uh, education. Go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for modern and classical languages and get started today. If you have questions or comments about this podcast, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.